It isn't much of a hot take to say that Silent Hill 2 is great, phenomenal even. It is my personal favourite game and I'm far from the first person to say that. The game has been talked about almost to the point of exhaustion on the platform and with the remake coming out at some point, I am sure it will be talked about even further. In Silent Hill 2, you experience the titular town through the eyes of James Sunderland, the point of view character. It is effectively a look into his subconscious mind. However, James Sunderland is not the only character in this game. There is a supporting cast that are highly reflective of the game's core themes, and many of them are instrumental in determining which of the three primary endings a player will get on a first playthrough. So today I'm going to be talking about Angela and her ties to the In Water ending, however there's also a lot to be said about Laura and her connections to both Mary and the Leave ending, and it's not really much of a hot take to say that the Maria ending is likely connected in some way to Maria. Eddie is the only character to not have a dedicated ending and I think that is a complete waste. They should add an ending in the remake where you can sit down with him at the bowling alley, eat a pizza and the credits roll. I think that would be great, put that in the game, please, I'm begging you. But Angela has always been my favourite character in Silent Hill 2. I think she is so unique and multifaceted in terms of the way she connects with the game's themes in various ways, and I think the creators knew they were onto something with her. They decided to put her on the box of the game, for one thing. It's not James, it's not Pyramid Head, it's not Mary, Maria, it's not Eddie, it's not the dog from the dog ending. The box art for Silent Hill 2 depicts Angela. Even divorced entirely from Silent Hill 2, Angela basically represents good Silent Hill entries. In a way, the concepts of familial trauma, um, femininity, and the horrors that are associated with that were explored very heavily in good Silent Hill games like PT, Silent Hill 3, and most recently A Short Message. Within the context of Silent Hill 2, Angela is just a all-round fascinating character. Her story runs parallel to James's. She's that classic trope of taking a bad ending version of the main character and confronting them with it. But she's also very different to James. Though the two come to the town for similar reasons and can end up having the same fate, her story is innately feminine and challenges the very masculine biases of the way James perceives the world. So today's topic is Angela from Silent Hill 2 and what she means to the overall messages of the game. We're going to be recapping her entire story, so spoiler warning for that. And I also want to give a content warning for Angela's story. It involves harm being committed against children, sexual assault, and the YouTube censorship word, which I cannot say, and it pains me that I cannot. So if any of that makes you uncomfortable, you can leave and no one will be mad at you. No one will even know. So yeah, put your health first. This video is shaping up to be a long one. So if you only want context for one specific meeting with Angela, just something you didn't quite get on your playthrough, there are going to be timestamps. There's going to be chapters. So you can just skip ahead. If you're here for the whole thing, best of luck to you. Get ready to go to sleep or play League or paint. Whatever you do when you listen to video essays. If you watch video essays, Wow, um, thank you. I spent some time on the editing, but I don't really care about being background noise, so, you know, do whatever you want. <laughs> and let's talk about Angela. Silent Hill 2 opens in a bathroom in a car park on the outskirts of Silent Hill. You are James Sunderland, a man who has come here after receiving a letter from his wife Mary telling him that she is waiting in their special place. Now, this is weird because Mary died three years ago of an illness and James is more than aware of that but he's showed up anyway. Following the path into the town James finds himself in the Toluca Cemetery and this is where you meet the first other person in Silent Hill, Angela. I'm not going to play the cutscene here but it is phenomenal. It has some amazing voice direction, the soundtrack done by Akira Yamaoka is amazing as always, and the fact that this was rendered on a PS2 boggles belief, so if you haven't seen it, go and check it out, it's like a weird eerie dream. But from this first interaction with Angela, we already have so much to talk about. Taking this scene entirely at face value, it is your standard horror movie setup, really. Angela says, this town is dangerous, you should not go in, and James says, I'm gonna go in anyway, because I love my lost wife. And it also sets up the similarities between the two of them, being that Angela is here looking for their mother, 
as well as their father and brother. So both Angela and James are people who have come to the town of Silent Hill in search of somebody important to them. The similarities don't just end there, however. Reading between the lines, it is clear that Angela is also looking for dead people people she knows to have passed away. In her very first appearance, she is observing a headstone, she's reading it. But later, she says, oh, I thought my family were here, not here in Silent Hill, here in Toluca Cemetery. She thought they were dead. In fact, across this scene, Angela seems to be more clued in or in tune with the supernatural nature of Silent Hill. She mentions that there's something wrong with the town, even though she hasn't entered it at this point and she also seems very confused when james mentions that he's lost she knows that they're meant to be there they're not lost i'm kind of lost lost this is a trait of angela's that continues throughout the entire game compared to james and eddie the other victims of silent hill she seems a lot more prescient she seems to have a greater understanding of what's going on around her here we see another similarity between angela and james which is that both of them enter the town despite knowing it's dangerous angela enters on her own pretty much immediately after telling james that it's dangerous to enter it both of them lack any real sense of self-preservation they both neglect their own safety in favor of chasing after these dead people also worth noting about angela here is her childlike nature and apprehension towards james she calls her mother mama before correcting herself but she also keeps james at arm's length at all times when he first approaches her each time he steps forward she steps back now you would probably do the same thing with a random stranger in a foggy graveyard but it's worth pointing out here because of what we learn about her later and her general apprehension towards men is a character trait she carries throughout the entire story the two wish each other luck and then part ways with james entering the town of silent hill it's here he has an encounter with the lying figure the first monster in the game and i think now is a good time to segue into talking about the game's monsters what they mean what they symbolize and how that ties into angela's storyline because this game has very intentional monster design this game has a very limited and small roster of monsters and that's because each of them is designed very intentionally the creator of the Masahiro Ito says that each of them is reflective of James Sunderland's story. Yes, each of them. There's a monster later on who we're going to have a whole section on where a lot of people assume to just be Angela's monster, but that's not true. We never actually see Angela's monster, according to Ito. Pretty much every monster represents James's relationship with his late wife Mary towards the end of her life. They are reflective of her illness. They are reflective of her monstrous appearance, which she herself comments on later when you hear her disembodied voice, but they're also just really horny monsters. This game has a boss called Fleshlip. This game has an enemy which is literally just two pairs of woman's legs strapped together. In the original concept art for the lying figure, they've got like these big red boots on. The entire roster of monsters, with two exceptions, are effectively representations of James Sunderland's sexual repression and his feelings towards his wife and just women in general. The now iconic bubblehead nurses are effectively just hypersexualized hospital workers, which really sets the tone for the kind of things that were running through James's head spending a lot of time in hospital, but it's also been confirmed by Ito that the design of them incorporates a child's face, representing James's desire to procreate, to make a baby. So all around just kind of gross and weird. But even more strange than these weird depictions of woman he has in his mind is the monster who is closest to himself in personality a demon of his own creation that plays up his worst traits so it's time to talk about famous dead by daylight killer pyramid head So in order to get to Rosewater Park, which James believes is his special place where Mary is waiting for him, he has to go through the Woodside Apartments. Whilst going through the Woodside Apartments, he does meet Angela for a second time, but before that he encounters Pyramid Head. 
Pyramid Head is a very interesting monster that has a lot of themes that are highly relevant to the overlapping storylines of Angela and James, but even if he was just a completely separate entity, I'd still want to talk about him, because what is going on with Pyramid Head? Like, in pop culture, what what is this? Okay, final, final spoiler warning for this PS2 game. Okay, awesome. So, the big twist at the end of Silent Hill 2 is that James Sunderland killed Mary. He suffocated his ill wife with a pillow. He then created Pyramid Head as a manifestation of his mind to punish him. Pyramid Head is all of his worst traits played up to 11, and that very much includes the sexual frustration. Pyramid Head is a roaming beast of pure id who effectively lives to kill and assault the other monsters. In his very first cutscene, he can be seen forcing himself upon a mannequin enemy before ripping it in half. So, overall, bad guy. Just very bad guy. So, it's always seemed weird to me that the fandom have collectively taken this monster, which is just a physical representation of a very mentally unwell man's desire to kill, harm, and force himself on others, primarily women, and gone, I want him. <laughs> I can fix him. That is the consensus on this character. Konami had to shut down the chat on Silent Hill Ascension, because people were just so down bad for Pyramid Head. They just really liked this serial sexual assault monster. Okay, and then we've got like these kawaii cosplays of Pyramid Head, which just very much like strike a nerve because why <laughs> are we doing this to this character specifically? And I, I don't mean to moralize here, there are other adaptations of the character, such as in the films, uh, or maybe just the first one. I've only seen the first one, the one with Sean Bean. Um, but he's in other games, like, he's in Dead by Daylight, right? So you can say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I like the character from those things, I didn't know the original context, or I'm divorcing him from that original context, and that's fine. Even within the context of Silent Hill 2, if you wanted to get really nitpicky about it, you could say, well, there is a picture of Pyramid Head at the Silent Hill Historical Society, so maybe James made him up based on a pre-existing legend, and I'm sure that's the direction they're going to take this planned backstory that they're giving him in the remake, which I also think is, is a bad idea. I'm not the only one who has issues with Pyramid Head. His creator wishes he never made him. He's like Frankenstein's monster. Sorry, that was all completely unscripted, but I just had to go off on one about Pyramid Head because it just boggles my mind that collectively, like even outside of Silent Hill, horror fans have just gone, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> I like this very troubling and disturbing monster, which maybe is kind of the point. <sighs> all right, cool. I've got all of that on my system now. We can go back to talking about Angela. I just needed to get that out there. The important things to remember about Pyramid Head for the context of this video and what I'm trying to say about Angela is that he is representative of the darker desires of James, especially towards women and that will become relevant as we go on with her story, his story, and how they converge. Okay, let's talk about the second cutscene with Angela. This cutscene opens with the most iconic image in all of Silent Hill, the entire franchise, and that's Angela lying down with the knife in her hand looking in the mirror. It's what's on the cover of the game. This cutscene actually opens with the two exchanging names because they forgot to do that the first time they met. James then immediately launches into telling Angela whatever she's planning on doing with that knife, there's always another way. Worth pointing out here is that Angela's tone has completely shifted. She is now sounding very depressed rather than the kind of childlike, inquisitive voice that she was doing before. Um, also worth pointing out here that at this point in the game, James has been running around beating monsters with a metal pole for like a while. So, the fact that his first thought is that Angela intends to use the knife on herself and not for defense is telling. I believe that to be that as the two are looking in the mirror, um, they are seeing reflections of themselves and also reflections of each other, that he is considering what he would do with the knife and he is having those thoughts and projecting them. Now, make no mistake, I'm not saying Angela doesn't have these thoughts. She says to James pretty much right after, it's what we deserve, and then are you afraid? So, 
She's clearly on the same wavelength as him, and even though he says, I'm nothing like you, when she says, it's what we deserve, it's not very convincing, and as we know, James can end up doing that to himself. That's the In Water ending. Interestingly, one of the factors in getting this ending is observing Angela's knife in your inventory, as though James is looking at it, considering the options, considering what he thinks Angela would do. The bad ending is an ending wherein James acts like Angela. When James does get given Angela's knife at the end of the cutscene, she hands it over saying she doesn't know what she might do with it. Fans have taken this to mean that she plans to use it on herself, however, as with all things Angela, this is a very multi-layered statement she's making. We'll come back to it when we discuss the labyrinth. After saying, are you afraid, Angela apologizes to James and seems to revert into her childlike mannerisms. When James asks, oh, did your mother live here because you're looking for her in these apartments? She's like, wow, how did you know my mom lived in Silent Hill? And she just responds to most of his questions by saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm tired. She only really perks up again when James steps forwards to take the knife from her, at which point she screams no and points the knife at him. This is an escalation of what we saw in the first cutscene, how she would always step away from him. This time when he approaches her, she actively attempts to defend herself, even though he has no hostile intentions. Similar to the first time you see her, she uses the term mama instead of mother, except this time she doesn't correct herself. She seems to be even more infantilized than when we first met her. Other smaller things to note about this interaction is that Angela is confirmed here to be a resident of Silent Hill. It's where her family are from, so that may explain her prescience and the fact that she seems to be more clued into what's going on across the entire thing. Another thing worth noticing is that James confesses here, he says, my wife Mary is dead. And Angela doesn't really react at all, because as we established in the opening scene, she's in the same boat, but James doesn't know that. So this is a pivotal scene because it's where you get an item which can cause you to basically have the same ending as Angela. So up until this point, the two stories have been mirroring each other, they are two people who are in the town looking for very similar things in similar situations. The only difference being that Angela is completely resigned to her fate, whilst James isn't quite. However, if he acts as Angela would, and spends time interacting with the item Angela gives him, then they will get the same ending. The differences between the characters are also highlighted in this scene, because again, James is very forward very pushy, very masculine, and as we see very clearly here, Angela doesn't like that. She likes having space away from people, she's very apprehensive, very skittish. So that character trait of hers is really dialed up in this meeting prior to how it was before. There is some tragedy here because James and Angela do briefly talk about traveling together. Now these two very traumatized people could be able to help each other through this town, I'm not sure that they would, but they could. However, due to Angela's distrust of men in general, and to be honest, James's issues with women, that can't happen. Okay, so the next thing relevant to Angela actually comes way later, so we're gonna jump way ahead and talk about the labyrinth. So the next official meeting with Angela is the abstract daddy boss fight which to me is the most disturbing thing in any game I've ever played but prior to that we can get an item called the blood soaked newspaper. The blood soaked newspaper details the death of one Thomas Orozco who we learn through inference is Angela's father. He was killed by multiple stab wounds to the neck and torso which brings me back to Angela's earlier statement I'm afraid of what I might do with this. It's not entirely that she's afraid of what she might do to herself, it's that she is afraid if James makes advances, she will kill him. We learn later on that Angela is very, very guilty about killing her father, even after all of the horrible things he did to her. And speaking of all the horrible things he did to her, 
the next thing we hear when wandering the labyrinth is this. Okay, so let's talk about Abstract Daddy. This is pretty much the whole reason for the content warning. Um, I loved this game and this scene did really stick with me, but I also had to put the controller down after it and like take a few days off. This was disgusting the first time I played it. It just disturbed me in a way that very few things can. So final warning because it's about to get very dark. Okay? Cool. And one final bit of levity before we talk about this incredibly disgusting thing. I hate this boss. Not just for what it symbolizes and what it means, that's all disgusting as well, but the arena is tiny. If you played Dark Souls and thought Capra Demon was just awful because you just go through the fog and get ganked, this basically shows you a cutscene and then puts you in a tiny space with a giant monster and you're playing on tank controls. This boss sucks. I, I hate Abstract Daddy. I just hate it. It's an awful boss fight. So this is the big reveal, basically, of what happened to Angela, why she has these childlike mannerisms, why she has these apprehensions towards men, why she has this propensity for violence, uh, both to others and to herself. It's all stemming from this traumatic event or traumatic events. This is a flesh-colored room with several holes in the wall with phallic objects going in and out of them. Angela literally screams, please, daddy, don't, before the boss fight starts. The creature is reflective of hunched figures over what appears to be a bed frame it's very clear what this is supposed to be and what it's supposed to evoke in the player and angela's brutal killing of the creature by throwing the tv on it and then later saying to james don't touch me and then when sobbing saying you could always beat me up like he always did when she's afraid of what james might do to her yeah, it's pretty clear what was going on with her father and why she killed him. So again, James and Angela's stories are mirroring one another's. They are both people who are very much informed by trauma. They feel trapped within their own minds, their own past, their own formative experiences. However, even when seeing this horrible thing that has happened to Angela laid out in front of him, James still cannot respect her boundaries. He reaches out to touch her at least three times in this cutscene. And again, this is just good writing. Angela and James are so similar. They have pretty much the exact same motivations and the same storyline in a lot of cases, but she's a victim of his darkest desires. She's a victim of the very things that we see expressed through things like Pyramid Head. James may not have the purest intentions toward Angela, and outside of just her dialogue and his body language, we also have a lot of meta-textual stuff to support that he's maybe not got the best feelings towards her. He may harbour some dark desires. So, as I said earlier, Abstract Daddy is not only Angela's monster. It is a manifestation of James Sunderland still. We don't see what she sees. That has been confirmed by Ito. And it is James Sunderland's monster. It just shows up as a regular enemy later on in the game. A treatment not afforded to any other boss unless you count Pyramid Head. So yes, in many ways this monster is just a reflection of horrible things that happened to Angela. However, the fact that James can conceptualize it and see it and has ideas in his head as to what it is, is dark, right? And that's supported by the fact that him and Angela have a very uncomfortable dynamic throughout the game. His storyline is all about sexual repression and his feelings of violence towards women. And Angela's storyline is about how traumatized she is by men who harbor those same feelings. You'll notice that pretty much immediately after this, James goes into Eddie's version of Silent Hill and doesn't really see any monsters because he doesn't connect with Eddie in that same way. He doesn't view him that way. In fact, in this meeting, Angela calls direct attention to those themes. She directly says to James, you're only after one thing, with the implication being, you know. And even though he disputes this, pretty much immediately after, he reaches out to touch her. Or you could just force me. 
beat me up like he always did. You only care about yourself anyway. You disgusting pig. Angela. Don't touch me! Angela continues to be completely correct about James during this time as well, which is further evidence that, yeah, he has all of these feelings that she's saying he has, even though he denies it. She says that he killed his wife, and it's probably because he wanted another woman, and that's true. Angela has been very prescient about all of the goings on in Silent Hill, as well as pretty much everything regarding James. She seems to know his story better than he does. So... It's not really much of a stretch to say that she understands his intentions better than he does as well. So in summary, yes, the abstract daddy boss fight is disturbing. It has those themes that pretty much everyone has pointed out being reflective of what happened to Angela and her traumas associated with her family. And that's all very sad. But there's also this very dark added layer that not a lot of people talk about which is that James can see this monster, he can conceptualize it. In many ways, he might see a bit of himself in it because all of the monsters he sees are tied to his psyche. And Angela is so consistently right about him, why wouldn't she be right that he has the desire to make advances on her? Okay, we're gonna move past this incredibly disturbing part of the game and talk a little bit about Eddie. So Eddie is a weird character. To me, he makes completely perfect sense. He is effectively a stand-in for the player. He helps to contextualize James Sunderland's actions as well as how truly dark James is. We'll get to that in a second, but it seems like a lot of people just don't like him. I came across this article when I was looking up what people thought about Eddie, and this guy is like, Eddie is just an incel with terrible writing, and when they remake it, they should just change him? Don't do that. <laughs> He's pretty easy to understand. So a lot of people assume that Eddie is just this guy who snaps and just starts killing people in Silent Hill, and then goes crazy and attacks James, because that's how he describes it. But if you listen to what he actually says when he details his motivations, it's that he is just racked with guilt and so desensitized to violence because he's just had to kill so many things in specifically Silent Hill, a town where monsters jump out at you and kill you. Humanoid monsters, right? Eddie mentions that one of the first things he killed was a dog. How many dogs have you killed in Silent Hill games? <laughs> right, like across the franchise, be honest, it's a lot. This article that I'm just attacking at this point, I'm very sorry to the author, but it's wrong. It points out that Eddie is a bad person or like just a lazy idiot who is badly written because he lets Laura run off into the streets. How many times does James do that? How many times does James let the incredibly traumatized Angela just run around on her own? How many times does James basically just abandon Maria? Eddie's the same. Why is it bad writing when he does it? You're telling me the player isn't trigger happy? The player isn't someone who just attacks everything that jumps out at them, provided they're not someone you've seen in the cutscene before? Eddie's the same. He's the same as James. Because ultimately, James kills him. James is a killer too. He just can't admit it in the same way that Eddie can. The reason I'm mentioning Eddie here is because it's a counterpoint to all these people who are saying, oh, well, James just sees abstract daddy because he empathizes with Angela, not because he harbors any of those feelings. Why can't James empathize with Eddie? They're the same. They're both people who just have an intrinsic murderous urge. James moralizes to Eddie, saying, you can't just kill people, and then kills him. He also killed his wife. James was a killer before he came to Silent Hill. Eddie wasn't, at least as far as we know. And you can say, oh, maybe they didn't have the budget for that. They didn't have a budget to put a dog in Silent Hill 2? There is a dog in Silent Hill 2. So yeah, in conclusion, this game does not have an Eddie problem that needs fixing. 
Eddie makes complete sense because he's just you. That's why he's not a deep, complex character. He's just a dude who plays like how you would play. Okay, so the final interaction with Angela, and also just the final area of the game, is the Lakeview Hotel. But before we talk about the final Angela interaction, let's address a question. Why is there another abstract daddy in the Lakeview Hotel? Now, the obvious answer here is budget and time. And Ito himself has commented saying, they spawn here because it's a video game. So there you go, that's your most simple reason. But he also clarifies that the wooden frame on the monster has relevancy to Mary. So it's just a game and budget reasons, but also it makes sense. He, he's kind of he's kind of giving two answers here. A much more obvious choice of boss to reuse in the area would be Fleshlip, because the area heavily talks about Mary's illness. So why abstract daddy? Well, think about it. James killed his wife on a bed, crouched over her, suffocating her as a result of his sexual frustrations. He attacked her because of this. So the symbolism of the monster has a very clear through line between James's killing of Mary, which is something he discovers he did in this area. This can also be read as symbolizing James overcoming his sexual frustration. As we talked about in the original Abstract Daddy part of this video, the monster is not just Angela's, it's something James conceptualizes too, not out of empathy, but out of an inborn desire to make advances on Angela. When he defeats it here, it's symbolic of him getting over that and becoming a better person. When he next meets Angela, there is a portrait on the staircase, which Ito has commented is the same thing as Abstract Daddy. It symbolizes the same stuff. Yet this is the cutscene where Angela finally gives James what he wants. She embraces him. She asks if he would like to love her and take care of her. And he doesn't return the advances. He respects her and gives her space finally at the end of everything but it would seem that it's too little too late it's only here that james can see the flames the symbol of angela's inner turmoil her trauma and her tragic final words for me it's always like this are made all the more tragic when you realize it was there the entire time but it's only now james has developed the ability to see it only now can he truly empathize with her and it's also worth noting here, going back to the design of the Abstract Daddy boss room, there was no fire there. So if we take Angela's words as literal, it is always on fire for her all of the time, then we weren't truly in her world at that point. The very phallic and disturbing imagery of that room is definitely symbolic of what she went through, but it may also symbolize a repressed desire of James's. This is the true tragedy of Angela's character. Her and James are so similar. They are both people informed by trauma. As I've said many times, they are people who come to this town on similar quests. They both seek validation or at the very least redemption from their guilt, but they can't help each other. Only when it's too late do the two of them seem to really understand one another. And that's because Angela is a victim of the very thing James seeks to rid himself of. Only when he has fully exercised it from his system could he be there for her truly, and by that point it was too late. You see, all Angela has ever really wanted is someone to tell her that it's not her fault. She didn't bring all of this upon herself. Because, as we learn in this cutscene, even her mother, her mama, the person she seems to value above all else told her it was her fault that everything happened to her. So when she's surrounded by people like James, who seem to out of nowhere make these constant advances towards her, it just validates that opinion. It validates what her mother said. Angela believes she brings it upon herself. But as we know, that's not true. She's trapped in a literal flaming hell of guilt about killing a man who, really, she had every right to kill. 
Her mistaking James for her mother at the start of this cutscene is not just her going completely off the deep end, it's her seeing him as someone who can offer that absolution, someone who can tell her it's not her fault. But James is too caught up in dealing with his own trauma to offer that at that time. So she resigns herself to her fate. She asks for a knife back and James says no. So she says, are you planning on using it on yourself? Here James says, no, I would never Roblox myself. I'm so sorry. Censorship. <laughs> um, but as we know, if he plays like Angela, he does. They both end the same. They both seek that way out of their trauma and their guilt. This is the final parallel between them. They are people who suffer the same fate because they are unable to connect with one another. They are too different. Both of them are too close to what has caused the other one guilt. This is the true tragedy of the In Water ending and the entire reasoning behind this video. Angela and James are people who, on the surface level, want the same thing. They want to come to Silent Hill and be absolved of their guilt. Throughout the entire game, their stories run parallel to one another, but they can't help each other. And in the end, it's too late. The two of them are capable of following the exact same path, and that makes their final meeting all the more tragic. Because it's only here, when things are far too far gone, that the two of them can truly see each other for what they are, and try to help each other, try and reach out. Angela represents everything that is wrong with James. His sexual frustration, his violence towards women, his inability to really understand what other people are going through. He didn't really seem to care that much about Mary, at least towards the end. And James represents everything that happened to Angela as well. Angela's storyline is so phenomenal and so memorable, not just because of how great it is in isolation, but how well it mirrors and contrasts James's. And to be honest, that's really all I have to say on the character. We've recapped the entire plot, we've gone through all of the main story beats, so yeah, that's, that's it. So, thanks for watching. If there's anything you want to add to the discussion around this character, leave a comment. I try to reply to all of them, and I'm always happy to hear other people's interpretations. I know I am very often wrong, or at the very least, not entirely right. <laughs> if you really liked, you can subscribe, like, and share around. That all helps me. And if you like a stupid amount, <laughs> you can become a channel member that will grant you access to members only polls to help determine what i will be putting out next and it also gives you like two emojis i'm trying to widen the selection but i'm so busy at work right now <laughs> okay cool thanks for watching see you around have a good day